Once, when Joshua was by Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing before him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you one of us or one of our adversaries? He replied, Neither, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped. And he said to him, What do you command your servant, my lord? The commander of the army of the Lord said to Joshua, Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. It seems that any time you have one group of people facing off against another, whether it be in an international conflict or in some sort of domestic squabble, the same thing always seems to happen. This side starts to claim that God is on their side. The other side claims the same thing. This idea of both sides claiming divine support is a bit ridiculous. How can both be right? But, ridiculous or not, the idea can have some very big repercussions. It can lead to downright dangerous outcomes, including people feeling justified to commit atrocities or to unjustly demonize their opponents. It might also lead to people continuing to fight, even when it is no longer in their own interest. The book of Joshua in the Bible tells the story of what is apparently a divinely sanctioned invasion of a territory. We are told that God gave specific instructions that, in the course of this invasion, the people living in the land needed to be entirely wiped out. The book includes accounts of genocidal events. Of all the parts of the Bible that you would think should reinforce the God is on our side way of thinking, the book of Joshua would appear to do that most. Perhaps that is why there is one short story near the beginning of the book that seems to get overlooked a lot. A brief little story that seems to call such thinking into question. I really think it's time for more people to know that story. This is Retelling the Bible. Episode 6.6 God you are on our side, right? Joshua was having a hard time sleeping. It was the middle of the night, and he had been lying with his eyes wide open on his couch for what seemed like hours. His mind was reeling with everything that needed to be done, and with worries about what might just go wrong in the next day, and in the days to come. For the preparations were all accomplished now, and tomorrow... Things were going to start to get real. The Israelites were camped not too far from the city of Jericho. Joshua had had his first glimpse of the walls that very afternoon. He had been blown away by the sheer size of them. It seemed impossible that anyone could ever take such a city. But that wasn't actually what bothered Joshua the most. They had made their plans, after all. Plans that included an encircling siege and a top-secret undermining project that would create a breach in the walls at just the right moment. 
It was what would come after that that was bothering him the most. When Moses had laid his hands upon Joshua and commissioned him in front of all the people, it had all seemed so abstract. Joshua would lead the people across the Jordan River and into the land that had been promised to them. The people who already lived there, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, those were just the names of tribes and nations. They were just ideas. And the notion that the Israelites could just wipe away all of the faceless people who belonged to those nations seemed like an acceptable thing. But since then, they had actually crossed the river and they had camped in the land now at Gilgal for quite some time. Joshua had now had time to see actual flesh and blood, Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, or at least some of the above. And he had had to face the reality that they were not all that different from his own people, or at least not all that different from what they aspired to be. He had seen the farmers working in their fields. He had seen the traders coming and going between the cities. Joshua had also sent some spies into the city of Jericho, and they had brought back reports of a people who were just living their lives and trying to get by. They were also a people who had a very similar culture, and their language was close enough that you could actually understand them, although sometimes communication could be slow and difficult. It was getting harder and harder for Joshua to think of the people who lived in this land as faceless enemies who deserved to be wiped off of the face of the earth. And yet, at the same time, Joshua knew that he had been given a mission. His task had been made clear. Moses had told him again and again, Yahweh had given this land to the children of Israel. They had to completely wipe all of these people out in order to be able to live in it as their God intended. It was God's plan, God's mission. God was on their side. And God was against the Canaanites, Hivites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. So, no matter what Joshua had come to feel about these people, his duty was absolutely clear. He could never give up, never back down, Never surrender. These thoughts just kept going around and around in his head. Damn it! This was getting ridiculous. What was the point of lying here in this couch if he wasn't going to get any sleep? With a sigh, Joshua got up put on his sandals and wrapped his cloak about his shoulders. He went out of his tent. It was a clear night and the stars blazed overhead. All was quiet in the camp and he could hear little more than the buzzing and chirping of a few insects. He looked around to see that the watchfires were all lit and that the guards who had been assigned to their posts on the perimeter of the camp were in place. They were there, but they weren't talking or laughing, as was often the case. 
They, too, knew the challenges that they would face in the morning, and perhaps had fallen into silence. Perhaps they were being haunted by the same concerns that had disturbed their commander on this night. Joshua began to pace, hoping that it would clear his mind. He walked the outer perimeter of the camp, startling a number of the sentries with his silent approach. But when they recognized the silhouette of their commander, they did not challenge him and let him continue on. So he moved forward, brooding in silence. At one point, however, something did snap him out of his distracting train of thought. As he was crossing the plain on the southernmost edge of the camp, the side that was closest to the city of Jericho, he came to a place where he suddenly realized that the watchfire behind him was hidden by some greenery. And yet the next watchfire, the one that he was moving towards, was still not visible. In other words, there was no one watching this spot between the sentries. And it seemed to be a perfect spot for some enemy to sneak in and cause some mischief or worse. Joshua realized that he was going to have to make some new arrangements of the guards and pickets, or they would risk disaster. But then, there, in the darkness between the watchfires, something jolted Joshua out of all of his wayward thoughts. A shadow that loomed in front of him, a shadow that he had taken up until that moment, for nothing but a stunted tree, suddenly resolved into a very different form. He made out two legs, a torso, a plumed helmet, and, most alarmingly of all, was not that branch, what he had taken for a branch, that stuck out at an odd angle, actually a naked sword? This all hit Joshua so suddenly that he physically jumped. His instincts as a seasoned warrior kicked in as his hand flew unerringly to the place where the pommel of his sword was supposed to be. It was not there. He cursed himself as he realized that he had left his sword and scabbard, still leaning on the edge of his couch. Somehow, still, Joshua managed to keep the panic out of his voice as he cried out, Halt! Who goes there? Are you a friend or a foe? The figure in front of him did not make a sound, but it did move. It moved in a way that convinced Joshua that it was indeed a living being. Speak, stranger, he shrieked. Are you one of us or one of our adversaries? The head underneath the helmet turned until the shadowed face was looking directly towards Joshua. And the voice when it came, was like nothing that Joshua had ever heard before. It was like a voice that had traveled through all the stars of the heavens and echoed from the depths of the ocean. There was something infinite behind it. Neither, said the stranger, but as commander of the army of Yahweh, I have now come. And so Joshua knew that he was in the presence of something that he had not reckoned with. 
everything that he had been planning, and all of the ideas that he had been clinging to about his position and his task suddenly seemed to be little more than foolishness. There was nothing else that he could do. He fell on his face before this apparition and stammered out, What do you command your servant, my lord? He was ready to do anything. He would have resigned right there and then. Or he would have ordered a brutal attack that murdered all the inhabitants of the land. Or he even would have embraced them as long-lost sisters and brothers. He didn't care what it was. He just needed to know what to do. But the only answer that he received, the only sense of an answer, was that he needed to remove his sandals from his feet. Because whatever happened here, this battlefield was holy ground. By the time Joshua had gotten his sandals off and prostrated himself once more, the shadowy figure was gone. Joshua looked up from the sandy earth to see nothing, nothing but the shadow of a tree with a branch jutting off at an odd angle. He was alone. Joshua thought long and hard as he made his way back to the tent. He was not quite sure what he should make of this strange encounter. It seemed to have called into question all of his assumptions about what he was here to do. It especially made him wonder if he had made a mistake in believing that God was unequivocally on his side. Really, this was very maddening. His mentor, Moses, had never seemed to struggle with knowing what God's will was. He seemed to receive messages all the time, and Joshua had envied the kind of certitude that such experiences seemed to give to the great leader. But now, now that Joshua had had his own experience, it seemed to have done the very opposite for him and filled him with all kinds of doubts and questions. But here he was, the one called to lead these people whether he wanted to or not. He knew that if he expressed any sort of uncertainty now, it would kill all of their confidence and that would sap their strength and it would undoubtedly lead to defeat. So, maybe someday he would pass on the story of his strange encounter with the commander of Yahweh's army. And perhaps someday the story would get inserted into the story of his great conquest in some way that it could be largely ignored by people who, like him, just couldn't afford to struggle with these sorts of questions. But Joshua resolved that he would not speak about what had happened this night to his troops. They had a city to attack. For many people, the basic premise of the book of Joshua, that God could have required his people to carry out a violent and genocidal invasion of an occupied land, has got to be one of the worst things in the Bible. Many would rather have nothing to do with a God who would demand such a thing. If you have ever felt like that, let me say, first of all, 
that it almost certainly never happened. Not like the Bible describes it anyways. Historians and archaeologists are agreed that there is no evidence of a massive influx of foreign invaders taking over and displacing anyone. That kind of massive change always leaves huge traces in the archaeological record, and there simply aren't any. What's more, cities that we are told the Israelites destroyed, cities like Jericho and Ai, weren't even inhabited at the time of the story. The general conclusion these days is that the Hebrew tribes, or at least most of them, were already living in the land in the time that it was known as Canaan. They were probably mostly living in the hill countries. They did form some kind of cohesive identity through their religious practices and eventually created a unified nation, or possibly two, that went on to dominate the land, but they did not commit wholesale slaughter or genocide. But the idea that they might have done such things, and that their God might have required them to do so, would not have been scandalous to them. It would have been something that they would have been proud of, because it was something that any powerful nation would have done in their age. And that is why I think it is rather significant that the story of Joshua and his encounter with the commander of the army of Yahweh did make its way into the book. It does reflect the fact that there were, even then, some people who did think twice about the idea of a god being on our side in the midst of a genocidal war. Someone understood better than we often do that God doesn't really take sides, at least not in the way that we would like. That is it for this episode of Retelling the Bible. Please subscribe so that you can get the next episode in a couple of weeks. And yes, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to share it with someone else who would appreciate it. The theme music for the podcast is Ada, and the mood music for this episode is Symmetry. The music is by Kevin MacLeod, licensed under the Creative Commons, and can be found at incompetech.com. You can contact me on Twitter at Retelling Bible, on the Facebook page, Retelling the Bible. Show notes for this episode have been posted at retellingthebible.wordpress.com. This is Retelling the Bible, and I have been your storyteller, W. Scott McCandless. <laughs>